Welcome to the new series, At the Movies. Uh, this is the, You're experiencing something that is brand new for real life. This is the first time we've ever repeated a sermon series. We did this last summer, and we had so much fun. I got such a positive response from it that decided to do it again. We might just make this an August summer tradition, is At the Movies. And so in this series, we take four weeks and look at, look at four of the summer's biggest blockbusters. So, so for this series, we're going to be looking today, we're going to be looking at Endgame, and then Captain Marvel next week, Toy Story 4, and then The Lion King. That's right. And, um, and so why, why spend a month talking about movies? Like, this is church, and we'd be talking about the Bible and all of that. Well, see, the thing about movies, why are we talking about movies? Well, one, yes, I love movies and pop culture. Um, yes, it's a great excuse to go to movies and call it sermon prep. But most importantly, I think great movies are great not because they're great entertainment, not because they're great escapism or have great CGI. Great movies are great because they touch on deep, timeless truths that resonate with our heart and soul. That's really what makes storytelling great. And in these movies, you can learn a lot from a movie. And that's why we're talking about them for the next few weeks. And they are fun, and they are wonderful, but you can learn a lot from a movie. So, today we're kicking off with the biggest movie ever, Avengers Endgame. It just recently passed, it passed um, Avatar as the highest grossing movie of all time. 2.8 billion worldwide. It is now the number one movie of all time. Crazy. But see, it's not just about money. This is an incredible movie because it was the culmination of 21 movies over 11 years. It had 59 returning characters. And in the final battle scene, there were 36 superheroes all in one scene. Remember in the first Avengers when we thought it was awesome that there were like six superheroes in one movie? <laughs> 36, all in one battle scene. And it was awesome, and the Russo brothers did this beautifully. It was an incredible movie. It was emotional and exhilarating and epic. Wonderful storytelling. A wonderful wrap-up to the first three phases of the, the MCU. So, so here, let's watch the original trailer to remind us what it was like. So go back to January, December or so, and, and imagine what it was like to watch this for the first time. <laughs> now, before I continue, I just want to say, spoiler alert. I am about to spoil this entire movie. Everything. <laughs> now, but this thing came out in April. If you have not seen it yet, you deserve to get it spoiled or you don't care, okay? <laughs> so let's just be honest. Spoiler alert, you're about to, if you, did, if you did not see it, you're about to learn everything that was important about Avengers Endgame. Here we go. So, there were so many incredible moments in this movie. There's Tony Stark's dying message. It'll always be you, Miss Pop. It was Thor killing Camp Thanos out of the blue. What'd you do? I went for the head. It was Cap fighting Cap. This is America's rear end. <laughs> this church after all. <laughs> On your left. And all the portals opening up. <gasps> and then... I love you, 3,000. Oh, I'm supposed to be cried in a superhero movie. And then, of course, the scene, I am Iron Man. The line that started it all is beautiful. So many amazing scenes in this movie. But there's, there's one story arc that I want to talk about today. Now, it's not the most important. In fact, it's not even relevant to the main story of the, the main arc of the story. It was very much a secondary storyline. 
but it holds a deep, powerful truth that I want us to hear today. And it's this guy. So this is Thor, the god of thunder. Uh, he's, he's, also, he's also called Fat Thor or Sad Thor uh, or, or the dude, Big Lebowski. Uh, he had a whole lot of names. And now, if you're not familiar with Thor, this is what he, he normally looks like. I know. <laughs> he, he is jacked. Oh, you got to stop drooling now. Okay? See, he's got muscles in places I didn't even know I had places. Okay? But to understand how he went from one to the other, you have to know a little bit of his story. So this is how we meet Thor at the beginning of Endgame. Now it looks like he's about to drop a sick rap album. <laughs> but no, that's not it. He's taken things pretty hard. It's been pretty rough for Thor. He lost his whole family and his best friend, all dead. His home world, Asgard, destroyed. He lost half his, the people of his kingdom to the snap. But most importantly, he feels personally responsible for not killing Thor, which resulted in the destruction of half of all living creatures in the universe. Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, I got way too much movie on my head right now. So he, he failed to kill Thanos, and he feels personally responsible for that. That is all of the weight that he is carrying. And that's a lot to bear. And so, well, the team does kill, they, they find Thanos, they kill Thanos, and, but it's too late. The damage has been done. And then now fast forward five years, and then this is him. This is where he is five years later. He's, he spends his days drinking beer and playing Fortnite with two of his buddies. And that's his whole life. Now, I know Marvel officially has named him Bro Thor, but this isn't Bro Thor. This is depressed. He's experienced immense trauma. He feels guilty, like a failure. He's self-medicating with alcohol. He's disconnecting from life in video games. He's gained weight. He's isolated himself. And he's in denial, pretending like everything, that he's fine. This is classic depression. And Thor's not dealing with it well. So the Avengers come up with a plan to go back in time, collect up the Infinity Stones, bring them back as a, as a way to reverse everything that happened. And Thor's part of it was for him to go back in time to his home world, Asgard, when his mother was still alive. And then they, they were going to re retrieve one of the, the pieces over there. So, so he, goes, he goes back in time. And in this trip, some amazing things happen. So first, he talks with his mom. And it was sweet, and it was tender, and it was amazing to watch him just be a kid. And he cried, and his mom held him and told him it was going to be OK. And if you've lost a parent, you know what, how much you would give for just one more hug. And that was incredible, and it was sweet, and he cries. And he kind of breaks down with his mom. Well, then there's this amazing scene. He stops, and he stretches out his hand. He closes his eyes, and nothing happens. 
Now see, to understand, anyone who knows Thor knows what this is. Now to understand this, you have to understand this. <laughs> this is Mjolnir. This is Thor's enchanted war hammer. And this, this hammer has the power to return to Thor wherever it is and wherever he is. It will fly back to his hand. But there's a catch. Only one who is worthy can wield Mjolnir. So I, of course, can wear it. <laughs> and I love this scene because, because he sits there, he closes his eyes, sticks out his hand. And you could tell he's not sure. He's not sure if Mjolnir will come back. And he closes his eyes, and he even peeks, he even peeks, opens an eye, looks. And then you hear it. No, not the phone ringing. <laughs> oh, perfect. <laughs> then you hear the rush of the wind. And then all of a sudden, and there's an amazing moment. It's a split second where he is surprised. And you can tell. If you, pause it, if you pause it right at the right moment, there's a look of surprise in his eyes. And then he smiles. And you can tell he's overwhelmed. And he turns his body in, and with a smile, almost practically crying, he says, I'm still worthy. And then they go on. They beat Thanos and all is well. Well, I know Thor's not the only one around here who struggled with feeling worthy. I know I struggle with that. And I know some of you do too. Struggle with failure. Struggle with, with feelings of not measuring up. And maybe even with depression. Maybe you've gained a lot of weight. I'm kind of 20-year-old Greg in a fat suit right now. I'm hoping to be a little less of a fat suit as I'm going. Or maybe you've tried to numb yourself with drinking, with video games, with shopping, whatever your self-medication of choice is. Maybe you've shut yourself off from others. You've stopped doing the things that you used to enjoy doing. I think we've all had days where we felt overwhelmed, where we felt like a failure. We're down on life, and maybe even you begin to wonder if it would be better if you weren't around. Those are dark days and dark nights. And we've all had moments like that, a day like that, or a couple days, but depression is something different. Uh, psychologists like to talk about depression characterized by two things. It's a pervasive, and a sustained change in mood. It's pervasive in that it colors your whole life. Work, at home, by yourself. And then it's sustained because it's there when you wake up in the morning and there when you go to bed at night. And it lasts for weeks, even months. Depression is not a lack of faith. It's not a weakness. It's a real mental health condition. And if you've ever found yourself feeling it, or you're in it right now, reach out for help. And some of you, some of you might even be on medication right now to help you with your depression. Because there's a biochemical component to it. And, and if that's you, keep taking your medication. It's not a sign of weakness. 
It's not a sign of, of a bad faith or that you're a failure of a person. It just means that something was a little off biochemically and, and there's some medications out there that can help. You don't need to pray more or try harder if you suffer with depression. And in talking with some folks who have, that I know there are good days and there are bad days. And that's okay as well. And if any of this describes you, I want you to know you are not alone. You are not alone here in the River Life family. And you are not alone in Scripture either. Because did you know that even in the Bible, there are people who struggle with depression? Now, the Bible doesn't use the word depression with the exception of a few translations. But the Bible is filled with godly men and women who undergo periods and bouts of depression. You might run across words like downcast, brokenhearted, troubled, miserable, despairing, or mourning. Those are all words that are part of this, this group, this thought group called depression. That we see. Those are all words we see in Scripture. And if you're here today and you've felt some of those, you are not alone. You are not broken. You are not, there's something that isn't wrong with you. You're among good company. Now today we're going to look at one of those guys. One of those guys who dealt with some depression. His name is Elijah the prophet. He's out of the Old Testament book, of 1 Kings is where you can find his story. Uh, he lived around 850 B.C., about 800, 850 is about where, when he was around. And he was the greatest religious figure of his time. He was honored and respected. In fact, one of his biggest miracles, one of his most amazing miracles, is when he defeated nearly him versus nearly a thousand prophets of foreign gods, Baal and Asher. He literally prayed fire from heaven down. He prayed rain to stop a drought. He had such faith and such a connection with God that he was able to do powerful things. Well, after the, the situation with the, the prophets of Baal and Asherah, the king and the queen of the time put a kill order out on him. They, they were so offended, they said, he's dead. I want him dead. I want his family dead. I want his pets dead. I want everything dead. So he ran. Because these were the most powerful people in the land. He ran. He got out of God. And he fled, and that's where we pick up the story. Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. When he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there while he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. He came to a broom bush, sat down under it, and prayed that he might die. I have had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the bush and fell asleep. He was scared, tired, discouraged. He had been traveling for days. That's over 100 miles that he journeyed. And then an extra day's journey after he left his servant in town. He wanted to quit. He was done. This was too much for him to bear. He prayed and then he laid down to 
to take a nap, which I absolutely believe in his mind, he was sure that was going to be his last. And he would just die. Well, God had other plans. God met him there in his depression. Here's what happens next. All at once, an angel touched him and said, get up and eat. He looked around, and there by his head was some bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. He ate and drank and then lay down again. I love that the first thing God did for Elijah was have something to eat. Eat something. So you know your mom was right all along. Here, eat something. And then gave him some water and let him take another nap. The story continues. The angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, Get up and eat, for the journey is too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank. Now this is a fascinating statement. The journey is too much for you. Now, God was preparing him for something big in the future. God had a big journey for him, an important one. But I also think God wasn't just talking about the future. I think he was talking about the past. And you could almost hear him say, this journey you've been on, it's too much for you. Will you let me come alongside you? Will you do this with me when you are at your lowest? The journey is just too much for us sometimes. Maybe you felt that. Maybe you're feeling that today. The journey is too much. My work life is too much. My marriage is too much. My kids are way too much. Maybe you felt that. And God is giving you the same invitation. Let me come alongside you so you are not doing this alone. Now God introduces him to what this next journey will be. Strengthened by that food, he traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. There, he went into a cave and spent the night. Okay, now, I know this sounds like just a normal road trip, but this is no ordinary mountain. This is no little Buck Hill or Mount Rushmore. No, no, no. This is horrible. Now, you might recognize it as a different name, Mount Sinai. This is where God met Moses. Gave him the Ten Commandments. Gave him the law. And initiated the covenant relationship with Israel as God's chosen people. That's why this is called the mountain of God. That was horrible. It is probably the single most important mountain of its time. And God said, I want you to go there. For 40 days and 40 nights. And he did, and he went there. And then he slept in a cave, which is kind of where you'd sleep. And then something amazing happened after that. God personally met him there at Mount Horeb. God physically manifested himself to Elijah. That is something that few people in the Old Testament experienced. Moses did. When he was on the mountain and God passed by, that's what God did again with Elijah. God passed by. God gave him his real presence. He reminded him that God is always there by being physically, visibly there. That was an amazing gift that he gave Elijah. And he said, I am here, and you are not alone. He also told Elijah that Elijah was doing a pity party, a huge, massive pity party. 
I'm all, I'm all alone, nobody loves you, they're all a bunch of sinners and lousy people, and they're ugly, and they're smelly, and nobody likes me. That's basically what he's saying. And God says, no, you're not alone. There are 7,000 people who are still following me, and they are behind you. They've got your back. 7,000 people are supporting you. You're not alone, Elijah. And then he gave him a mission to do and go on from there. But this was an amazing moment where God told Elijah, continue, keep up the good fight. You have my presence. You are not alone. Keep this up. See, now let's, let's kind of recap what God did for Elijah in this story. What God did was miraculously met his physical needs. Gave him a purpose and a mission. Gave him a personal, intimate encounter with him, with God. And then reminded him he's got people on his side. All in the span of one chapter in 1 Kings. Now, all in all, God reminded Elijah, you are still worthy. You are still worthy of being cared for by God. God said, you are still worthy of my mission and my purpose. He told Elijah, you are still worthy of my presence. And then God told Elijah, you are still worthy of having friends on your side. And you know, Elijah needed to hear that because he was ready to throw in the towel, be done with it all. And I think we need to hear that as well. Elijah isn't the only one who struggled and felt like giving up sometimes. I think we, I think you need to hear this, that you are still worthy of being cared for by God. You are still worthy of God's mission and God's purpose. You are still worthy of God's presence. And you are still worthy of having people believe in you. And most importantly, you are still worthy of God's love. There's one thing you need to hear today. Is you are still worthy of God's love. That might be the single reason you are here today. That is why God brought you to church, to hear this. You are still worthy of God's love. No matter your failures, no matter your sorrow, no matter your situation, you are still worthy of God's love. If Thor, the strongest avenger, needed to be reminded that he was still worthy to wield Mjolnir. I think it's okay if we need to be reminded that we are still worthy of God's love. So when I was watching Endgame for the first time, um, and I saw like Thor get off bad, and then the little redemption moment with his mom, and it was so sweet, and he was crying, I was crying, the whole theater was crying, and, and, and then, and I knew the big fight with Thanos was coming up, and I firmly believed that at some point between the scene with his mom and the ending fight, he would transform again. He would transform back to Jack Thanos. I'm sorry, Jack, I get both of those guys mixed up today. But, but Jack Thor, I, I'm sure it was gonna be somewhere where he grabs me, he grabs me and goes, no! Lightning comes down and he transforms into 
rent for. But they didn't do that. He still did the wrong. And he got his, his outfit. Yeah. He got like a cool braid with his messy beard and his, his messy hair turned into kind of cool dreadlocky things. But he was still that far. And I think that's so important because it's not his muscles that made him four. It was his heart. It was his worthiness that was bestowed upon him at birth. And see, we need to be reminded of that. All of us, whether, whether you've gained a few pounds, over the years, whether you feel like a failure, you feel like you've let down anybody in your life, and maybe if you suffer from depression, whether you're getting some help for it or you're not and you're too afraid to reach out, this is a reminder for all of us. This is a reminder to the tired, to the lonely, to the rejected. It is a reminder that you are still worthy of God's love. You are worthy of God's love because he created you. And you are worthy of a relationship with him because Jesus Christ died for your sins so that you could have a relationship with God. You are not worthy by anything you do. You are not worthy by anything you look like, thank goodness. You are worthy because God created you and Jesus Christ died for you. And you are worthy of God's love. So as, as we wrap up here and, and we're going to do our, our final song, um, so I'm going to do something to help us remember this and to help you remember this. It's a little silly and it's a little cheesy, but hey, why not? So during our, our, our next song, I'm going to be down, down on the floor there with Mjolnir. And if you feel like you need a reminder that you are still worthy of the love of God, come on down, and I will hand you the hammer. <laughs> because you are still worthy. I told you it was cheesy. <laughs> and I think sometimes it helps to have something that reminds us. This was a challenging sermon to put together because there were a lot of times I cried during it. In fact, I even prepped myself just in case. So I've had moments where I haven't felt worthy and felt like a failure. And as silly as it was when this arrived from Amazon, <laughs> I liked it. So, if during, during the next song, if you, if you need a reminder today that you are still worthy of God's love, come on down front. You can hold the hand. You can wheel me over and I'll look you in the eyes and remind you of the deep, timeless truths that Thor learned and that we can touch. You are still worthy of God's love. Join me in prayer. God, thank you that you love us. We have, just, we have done so much to not deserve that love. In fact, we've done so much against you and against those around us, even ones we love. We have sinned against you and we have sinned against those around us. And we deserve the exact opposite. Your rejection. Thank you that you don't give us what we deserve. Thank you that you don't treat us by what we do 
or what we look like or how we feel. God, you love us because you created us. You love us because you want a relationship with us. And you love us because you want to spend an eternity with us. Thank you. Thank you, God, that we are still worthy of your love. Not because of us, but because of you. So I pray that today we can just sit in that love. Not try to understand it, not try to deny it, not try to rationalize it away. But just sit in your presence, in your love, in the power and presence of the Holy Spirit, and let us soak in that with you today. I thank you that you love us. Not for anything that we do, but exactly for who we are. In the name of Jesus Christ, the one who died and saved us from our sins. In his name I pray.